Well, good morning. Thanks for choosing to praise and worship with us this morning. If you would, stand to your feet, and let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Sing along if you if you remember it from last time we did it. <laughs> There's a song that's rising up in me A song that'll set the captives free A song of hope, a song of praise A song that's written for these days There's a song that's rising up in me There's a song that's rising up in me be seated. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this great Lord's Day as we come together and praise His name. Uh, especially great to see our first time guests with us. What a joy it is to have you here. We hope you're already enjoying the presence of the Lord as we worship and praise Him together and we're so glad that you're here. As you came in, you should have received a welcome card like the ones up on the screen. If you didn't, look in the chairs right in front of you and there's some there as well and We'd appreciate if you'd take a little time to fill that out. Uh, if you have a prayer request that we would uh, be able to lift up to the Lord for you, write that down as well, and we'll be praying and believing God with you because many people are going through a lot of difficult times, and uh, we believe in prayer, amen, here, and we believe prayer changes things. And so write that down and let us pray with you as well. And so hang on to that card. We have a gift that we'd like to give you at the end of the service for being our very special guest. But our folks want to welcome you here this morning. And if you are a very first time here at Believers Fellowship, if you'll just relax and remain seated. Members, regular attenders, get up where you are and find our guest.
Praise the Lord. As you make your way uh, back to your seats, as uh, if you would stay standing, uh, this is the time in our service that we have our scripture reading. And so we've asked Karen if she would come this morning and read today's scripture. Good morning. The reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being lifted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you today. And Father, we have so much to be grateful for, Lord, as we come into your presence. Father, we just pray that you would just move in a mighty way. Father, you, we depend on you and your power and your might, not our own. Father, so many needs that's represented here. Father, we pray that you'd meet those needs, whether they're salvation, whether they're grief, whether they're marital, financial, Lord. There are so many things that people are burdened with. Father, we pray today, Father, that you would just move in our midst and that your will be accomplished. And Lord, most of all, you would be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord.
worthy of every song we could ever see. Amen. Praise God. And isn't he worthy of every song we could ever sing? He's a gracious God, a loving God, and a God who is willing to put everything on the line for you. And for our eternity and through all the ages, we will gather around the throne of God and we will worship him and praise him and not be bored for one moment or thinking about lunch or anything else. <laughs> Amen. Our hearts and our minds will be upon him. He is holy. We'll worship him forever. <laughs> Yeah. 
Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord for our music team that blesses us every Sunday in worship. We're so grateful for them. Let's give them a praise the Lord because they, uh, they bless us every Sunday as they lead us into worship. Well, this morning we're in part three of building up the body, the ultimate body building. And so that's uh, something we're all involved in, not just a few. We're all called to do that. And I'll kind of just review of the two points we've already covered in this series. One, we must keep our love for and lordship to Jesus as the foundation and at the forefront of all we do because this passage starts with the word he. He gave everything that was necessary for the church to do what it needs to do and we need to keep him first, foremost, foundational. Everything we do must be centered around him. And then last week we went over this verse, we must keep equipping our members for service. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. It's not just the pastor, it's the pastor and the team of people that God's put together to be the body of Christ to carry out God's plan for the world's salvation and for people growing in Christ. It's a team effort. It's us. It's got to be all of us. And if you're saved today, that us is you. That work saints, that's you. That's all of us. We're all called to do that. We even mentioned that you've already been prepared for it. You say, I hadn't gone to any training. In your salvation, you got it. You got prepared beforehand for this. So you've been equipped all your life once you've got saved. I said all your life. Ever since you've been saved, you've been equipped. It's ready to go. It's inside. Uh, just like we had a grandson uh, born. He doesn't have any teeth. But they're in there somewhere and they'll pop out when they're needed. He was already prepared. You know, they don't go back and say, Doc, we need to install teeth. They were left out. No, he was prepared for those teeth a long time. They just hadn't shown up yet. And you've been already prepared. So I, don't, I can't do it. No, they're already in you. And so that, that was what we went, went over last week. So this week we're on part three, or point three. We must keep building up people with God's word and emphasizing the importance of the body of Christ. Because it talks about to the building up. It's got to be built up. You say, is that in growth numbers or is that in maturity? Yes, it's all of that. It all becomes part of one because when you focus on growing the members as far as maturity it will end up in growth. You know, you've been born again, but once people are born again, then they need to have more babies. In other words, have more people to spread the gospel to and so that people will hear about God's word. And so we're looking at this word here that has to do with building. It's like building a house is the way the Greek word is, but we're not building a house. We're building the body of Christ. We're helping that. We're involved in that. You say, well, how do you do that? That's a great question. How do we build it? Well, the other verses in the Bible let us know. Peter said it this way, Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so by it you may what? Grow. That little baby that we have, grandbaby, that baby's growing because he's getting milk. And the milk is the what? The word of God. And if you're a Christian and you want to grow, the word is your milk. The word eventually will be your meat as you begin. You know, we, that little baby's not going to always be on milk. Eventually, he'll be having a T-bone, you know, but he won't be having it now. Let's start with milk and get enough milk, and then you begin to move on up the food chain, so to speak, and then you can... But a lot of Christians stay on milk their whole life, and they don't wonder why they don't grow. You start out with milk, and then you move your way up, but the only way to build up the body is the same way we build up our body, through the word which is the bread of life. you got to eat on that. A lot of people, I'm not a strong Christian. I'm kind of weak. Well, you're not eating. If you don't eat, you're weak, physically and spiritually. It's the Word. If, if you want to see what, uh, I heard one time a guy said, you keep betting on these. They had dog fights and stuff. And the guy would say, you know, on these dog fights, you always bet on the winner. Those are your dogs, but every one you bet on is the one that wins. He says, I know, because I know which one I feed and which one I don't feed, and I bet on the one I do feed. So he wins every time, because the weaker dog doesn't get nutrition. Acts says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which is able to build you up. There it is right there. There's the solution of how do we build up the body of Christ. We feed them the word. We feed them the word. That's why if you're not in a church that's feeding you the word and you're not daily feeding on the word, you'll be weak. You know? And I hope you're not just getting the word here every day. I hope you're getting some word. You know? That'd be like saying, well, I ate on Sunday. I'll eat next Sunday. I don't believe anybody in here ate last Sunday and then this Sunday will be your next meal. If it is good for you for fasting for the Lord, but uh, probably not many of us would say that was our last meal. You kind of want to eat regularly. You want to take in the nutrition of God, God's word regularly, and that's how we get it done. And so if you look at it, you think, okay, the verse that we're looking at, verse 11 says, building up, we see how to do that. Of the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? In case, in case we don't know, Ephesians makes that clear too. And he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. What's the body of Christ? The church. The church is the body of Christ. He is the head and we are the body. We are connected to him and we are his hands, his feet, his arms, his legs, as he is the head. And that's how he does his ministry through the church because we are his body. Isn't that phenomenal? That we're called the body of Christ. What a great high calling that is. Greater than anything we'd ever do in life. Whatever, if you became president of the United States, you became a senator, you became a billionaire, nothing could say that I am the body of Christ, the son of the living God will use me as his body parts to carry that out. Because remember, he's just the head. And I don't say that that's not just. It means he's ruling over everything, but he needs a body. Now, he doesn't need anything. You know what I mean. He's self-sufficient. He's God. But he uses us because he uses his body. I mean, and we'll go into that more detail as we get about the body ministries because we are that, that body. Now, yes, the church is universal, meaning the body of Christ is all Christians everywhere. That's positionally. Positionally, the body of Christ is all believers. But practically, the body of Christ is a local church. Paul wrote a letter, seven letters to local churches. And so positionally, the church is every Christian in all the world. But practically, the body of Christ is a local church like ours, where Practically, we carry out the body works of the body. And the body is supposed to work because when your body doesn't work, then you know your limitations. You're in the hospital, you got disease, or you got limitations. And so we need to keep the body healthy and we keep it growing and building it up with the Word of God. Now, yes, some people, as far as attendance, can't go because of health, because of some situations physically, some work situations. Some people do have legitimate excuses, but some people that don't, we need to be regularly in the body of Christ so we can carry out the work of the body of Christ. So that we're together as a team working together because we are his body and the body of Christ has to be united. Your arm doesn't work well unless it's connected to your body. If you don't believe that, cut it off and see how well it works. It works well because it's connected to a body. And we work well when we're connected to each other. But I'll tell you what, the importance of this body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church. It just said it there on Ephesians 1.22, the body of Christ. So it's saying, building up the church. That's what it's saying, building up the church. But you know, church has become... Less and less and less and less important in this society. Look at these statistics. People describing themselves as Christians, the silent generation, which I put that age on because you hardly ever hear about that, 84% of them said that they were Christians. Baby boomers, 76%. Millennials, 49 A Gallup poll showing the percentage of U.S. populations who say that they're members of the church from 37, 1937, you've seen it go down. 73, 70, 65, 59, 50, and that's going to continue to drop. Why? Because the church isn't important to people's lives. It's like, hey, I'm a believer and I don't need church. 
Hey, there are no Lone Ranger Christians. If you're saved, you're a body part. And a body part ought to be in its body and not separated from its body because we've already determined body parts don't work well separate. If you get a body part amputated, it's, it's going to die. It has no nutrition from the other body parts. And many people, when they get to heaven and they are able to say, I don't know, Lord, where you were in this situation. He said, you needed to be in the body because body parts minister to other body parts. Right? I mean, that's how my body gets a lot of what it needs is from the other body parts. And a lot of people say, God, where are you here? And where are you there? And where are you? The body is ministering to each other, and God will minister to you many times through the church. And what we don't receive, we keep in prayer saying, God, where are you in this? And God's saying, I would provide it in the church. I've got body parts in the church that would minister to you if you were connected to the body. And people have been getting, and it culturally it's that way too. Just churches just completely kind of went away. 9-11, we had a big, every church almost in America boomed the Sunday after 9-11 because we thought, hey, the, the world's coming to an end. Oh, but the Sunday after that, we were back to normal. We didn't need God anymore. We thought we needed him that Sunday, but after that, it's like, mm, I got it now. Well, that's, we need to see the importance of the body of Christ. And I'm going to give you several of these today, which really wasn't even in my notes or to do anything, but the Lord just really impressed on me this week that this needed to be really expounded upon in a great way. We need to come back to seeing how important the church is. I know we're in church. You're saying, aren't you preaching to the choir? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I think we need to leave out of here saying, you know what? I need to be so motivated that God and his church are important in my life. And so we'll just hit this one point. And again, I was just going to make it like in five minutes, but the Lord just kept impressing on my heart to really nail down on this for all of us and for me as well. Why every Christian should see the church as important, the body of Christ that is, And as a high priority in their life, not just Christ, but his body, his church. And the number one thing I want to discuss, and this will be all that we'll discuss today, is because the church is his bride. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that is his bride and listen if your bride is not very important in your life you're going to have if you're not already having troubles I need to hear some amens from some men if she's not a high priority you're going to have difficulty if your husband's not a high priority in your life you're going to have difficulties because marriage if you are married next to Jesus your spouse ought to be a high priority and guess who Jesus is married to we are his bride that's why it says husbands love your wives because Christ loved the church his bride that was his bride that was the one he died for that was the one he gave his life for And this institution, you know, the first institution God created was marriage. Why was that? You know why I believe he made our bodies the way he made them? For an illustration. Why? Because this body is going to be glorified one day. I don't believe it will be like it is. It is the way it is, I believe, for one reason, so that it could be an illustration of the body of Christ. Why is marriage, why was marriage the first institution? Well, Pastor Tim, we need to have families and family structure. Well, he could have done it any way he wanted to do it. He could have even just kept creating and not even did marriage, right? Create, 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 create. I mean, he could have done it that way. Why did he do it the way he did it? Well, I don't know fully the mind of Christ, but I believe marriage was done for one major important reason, and that was to be an illustration of our relationship with Christ, Christ and the church. That was its main reason. 
Why? Because we're going to find out later marriage is going to be dissolved in heaven. So it's going to be done away with anyway. So it's only an earthly thing. And it's an earthly thing, so we'll get the picture of what salvation truly is. I don't know about you, even when I'm reading how to put together something, I love pictures. I love YouTube to watch a video on how to do something versus reading. Okay? Don't look at me that way. You do too. You, you like pictures, okay? You know, give me a book with pictures. Give me an illustration book with pictures. Let me see it in picture. And here as well, the Lord allowed us to see. Jesus made this statement. I came not to destroy your law, he told the Jews, but to fulfill it. I didn't come to destroy it, I came to fulfill it. Everything you've been learning all in the Old Testament, that's me. I didn't come to destroy it, I came to fulfill what was already written. And I believe not only that, but the customs of the day. He came to fulfill even those Jewish customs. And I wanted to make this point really drive home. And I know many of you have heard it in Wednesday nights I brought over it. But I wanted to put it in this to show how important this one point is. It's all through the Bible. It talks about in the Old Testament about we being betrothed to God and that God is our husband. I mean, that's all through the Old Testament. And then now you come to the New Testament and it's God in flesh who is our groom. And it'll also bring home the point about am I saved? You know, I've never asked anybody, are you, uh, or let me get back up. I've asked a lot of people, are you saved? Are you a Christian? And they'll say, I don't know, or I think I am, or I hope to be. I've heard those questions. But I've never asked anybody, are you married? And they say, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I may you have. I've never heard anybody say, I, I, just, I just don't know. Pray for me that I'll know. You're probably going to get a frying pan when you get home then. So You know, you just know. Well, if you're married to Jesus, you're going to know. Right? You're not going to say maybe, probably, whatever, because that's what it is. Salvation is that marriage relationship where you make a commitment to Christ the way you made the commitment to your wife and say, till death do us part. I'm going to make this decision to follow Christ. I'm going to be a Christ follower. From this day forward, so help me God, give me the strength to do it. Forgive me of my sins and I want to walk with you. You, you were raised from the dead. You walked in, in a perfect life and you died on the cross for me. And so you make that commitment to Christ. And then you won't have to say, well, I think I am. I may be. You'll know that you're married to him. So let's look at some things that I think will draw this so home, this point about how important the church is, by us looking at that tradition of how a Jewish man and a Jewish woman in Jesus' day made that commitment. Number one, the Jewish man sought a bride. It was always the man's responsibility to go out seeking. I know today you got a little of both. You got some women going out and looking for a man, and that's, that's okay. But in the Jewish culture, the man was the initiator. Okay? He went out looking for a bride. Jesus sought out us, sought us out to be his bride. Jesus says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to seek. He was looking for a bride to save. He was looking for sinners. He made the initiation. Now you say, I was seeking the Lord and I found him. No, you weren't. He was seeking you and you finally realized he was really seeking you and you weren't seeking him. He was looking for you. And one day you stop long enough to say, you know what? God's trying to get my attention. He wants to save me and make me his bride in salvation. And so he was the initiator. And same way in this culture, and same way that Jesus, he was that Jewish groom who went out to find a bride, which was you and I if you already know Christ. He was seeking us. The Bible says he's the drawer. He's the initiator. He's the one that starts all this stuff. If you're saved today, that's because he was looking for you. He was seeking you out to save you, and you responded. Second thing is, the Jewish man sent ahead his best man to make things ready for the meeting. In other words, this friend would go and try to make arrangements so that he could meet that bride that he's wanting to date and marry and whatever, so he sent a, 
a guy that was ultimately what we would know as the best man to, to go out and find this bride. Jesus sent his best man, John the Baptist, to make things ready. Matter of fact, John the Baptist, it said John the Baptist came preaching and then later on he refers to what Isaiah would say, which was his fulfillment, make ready the way of the Lord. John, you go out and make things ready for the groom to meet his bride. He said, but Pastor Tim, you're kind of stretching this because if, if that were the case, John the Baptist would refer to himself as something about being a best man. Well, he did. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which he goes on to describe what they did, that's me. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the best man. I'm not the groom. I'm the best man of the groom. Why do you say it that way? Because those Jewish people knew the tradition. They knew what they did when they got married. They sent the best man out to prepare the way. And John the Baptist says, I am that best man because I'm preparing the meeting of the two. Now what happens when you got a matchmaker that puts two people together? Does he hang around and say, I'm going to go on the first five dates with you guys. <laughs> Come on, man, you're quite welcome. We want you to go on every date with us. You put us together, so no, no, no. John would go on to say, he must increase. I got to decrease. I got to get out of the picture. These two are together. I'm going to back off. I'm not going to go on the dates with them. I've got to decrease. I just introduced him. It's time for me to decrease so that he may increase. Because it's not about me. I'm just the preparer. I'm not the groom. The one that has the bride is the groom. And I don't have the bride. He was telling those people, I'm not the Messiah is what he was saying. <laughs> I'm just the best man. You're looking for Jesus. Because Jesus has the bride and I don't. Wow, what... Verses to draw us to this conclusion how important the church is because it's the bride of Christ. And he did just like their customs did. One, he sought the bride. Two, he sent somebody to prepare the way. That Jewish groom would send somebody to prepare the way as well. And then the third point, the Jewish man met with his father to determine the required price to take her as his bride. You know, when I do weddings, I make this statement who gives this woman to be married to this man most preachers say that well back then it wasn't no give it's what money are you going to pay or how many cows how many horses how many lambs how many sheep are you going to give me for my daughter later on that amount of money became the word became the wed are you ready to pay the wed which became wedding they had to pay. And so that Jewish groom would go to that dad and say, how much? Well, that little girl, that young Jewish girl would hope that her dad would set a high price because that showed her value. I'm sure she would ask daddy, what'd you get? If he said, one goat. She, didn't, she wouldn't have felt very good. I'm only worth one goat. That's all I'm worth. Oh, but if she said, oh, man, I asked for 50 cattle, 10 camels, 100 goats, 15 donkeys, that's what I got for you. And she's like, oh, my goodness. And he was willing to give it? Because once the dad set the price and the groom said, I, I can't go that, that's too much sacrifice, then he'd leave. But boy, don't you know that bride, when she heard that high price, she thought, oh, I am somebody. I am somebody because if any man would think I'm that valuable, he's the man for me. They made the arrangements. Jesus paid the price for him to take us as his bride. 
as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. The highest wed ever paid for any bride was Jesus because what higher price can you pay for somebody than giving your life? There's no higher price. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how many possessions you give. Nothing is worth more than your life. And he said, you know how much it's going to take to take you and me as a bride? It's going to take me dying. And I love them enough to die. And if you want to know how valuable you are, that's how valuable you are as a bride. The highest price imaginable to take you. If that doesn't bless your heart, I don't know what can that you, to take you as his bride, required him to pay the wed of his life. That was what was set. That's what he was willing to pay. And he took us as his bride for that extremely high price, just like a Jewish man would do as well. Acts 20, 28 said, The shepherd of the church of God which was purchased with his own blood. The church was purchased by his blood. Listen to what John MacArthur said. The church is the most precious reality on earth since the ultimate price was paid for it when the Lord Jesus Christ purchased it with his own blood. (laughs) The church is the most precious reality on earth paid for by the blood of Jesus, God's Son. Wow. Church isn't important to me. Man, how can we say that? It's the bride of Christ. It's his bride. We need to minister to his bride, love his bride, care for his bride. It's his bride. Man, if people don't take care of your bride, it ought to upset you. Somebody's mean to your bride. I'm not saying be vindictive. I'm not saying, but it ought to stir your heart that somebody was mean or ugly or hateful to your bride. To your bride, or didn't take, and doesn't it really bless you when somebody takes care of your bride? Yeah, they did something for her, they 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 helped her, or whatever. That's that's a blessing. Now the fourth thing is, the Jewish man would ask his chosen, that's who he chose, to be his bride, and she would need to accept his offer. See, Jesus is making the offer to you, but he's not going to force you to come. He's not going to force you to be his bride. That's got to be your choice. The bride wasn't, once all this negotiating and the price was paid, or, hey, I'm willing to pay this price, whatever, okay, now, honey, do you want to marry him? Do you want to receive his offer and take him as your groom? And that's our choice as well. We must, by faith, accept Jesus' offer of his free gift of salvation. We went over this verse on part one of our series, saying it was really in context to the church at Laodicea, but we can also apply it to salvation. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the invitation. Will you marry me? And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come into him, and I will dine with him and be with me. He stands at the door and knocks. He gives you the invitation to come for salvation. But the locks on the inside, the knobs on the inside of the door. He could have just came on in, but he don't come on in. He knocks, and that's the invitation. But a lot of people will have to stand on judgment, and they'll, they'll say, you know what, I heard that invitation before, but I never, I never took you up on it. I heard the knock. I heard the conviction. I felt it, but I never responded. I never opened that door for you to come in and dine with me and us to have that great relationship and for me to follow you all the days of my life. I never opened the door. I kept it closed. And we'll have to know for all of eternity that we heard the knock and we never opened the door. That's that little voice inside of us that's saying, you know this is right. You know this is what you need in your life is Christ. Let me come in and let me show you what life is really like, but because you need me, your your sins stand between me and you. Let me come in and forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and become your Lord and your Savior. The fifth thing is the Jewish man would leave his bride to prepare a place for them to live. 
Now, unlike us, when we get engaged, you still see each other in our culture. You know, you got engaged and you still continue to see each other till the marriage, but not so in this culture. When the Jewish man made his offer, he paid the price, she accepted the offer, then he would just leave. He would not only just leave, he would leave for a reason to say, I'm not going to see you anymore until I come back and get you. I'm going to go prepare a place for us to live. I mean, you've got to have a place to live when you get married, so that was his job to work on a place for them to live. Why did Jesus leave? That's it. That's, he was a good Jewish groom. He was following their culture. He was following their traditions. And he left just like a good Jewish groom would leave. And so when he went to prepare, that's what the scripture says, Jesus left earth to go prepare a place for his bride. We're his bride, so we need a place to live. Jesus told him, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Because I'm your groom. You've come to me in salvation. This place is only for believers. In other words, he wasn't going to prepare a place for every bride. He was going to prepare a place for his bride. And that's what that place is for us. He's saying, while I'm gone, I've got a job to do. You've got a job to do. And my job is to prepare a place. And that's what he's doing right now for his bride. And there's many rooms. It's a big place. And listen, it's one house and many rooms. And if you're not part of a church learning how to be with other believers, you're going to be in a house with other believers for all of eternity. Okay? It's just one house with many rooms. Okay? The wrong interpretation is my father's house or many mansions. That's not a good translation. It's many rooms because you don't have mansions in a house. You have a house, you have many rooms. Okay? So if you're saved, one day you're going to live in father's house with many rooms and those other saints will be there as well. And it won't be much of a shock to us because we've been operating as a church anyway with other believers. Learn how to do it. Learn how to take part in it. It'll just be a good, even, smooth transition because he's prepared for us a place and he's making that place in his father's house. The Jewish man came back at an unknown time to get his bride to live with him. That's how it worked back then. You told your bride, okay, I got all this done. I'm going to prepare a place. And you know when I'm coming back to get you? She said, when? I said, I don't know. <laughs> you better be ready. You better have your dowry ready, your pots and pans, your cooking stuff, your wedding stuff, the stuff for the curtains, everything you're going to want to make. You better have that ready because when I come back, boom, you won't have any time to get ready. Because I'm coming back at an unexpected. Isn't that neat? We don't, have that, we don't have that culture here, the tradition, but isn't that neat? That's how they did it back then. That's how the Jewish people did this part of weddings. They knew it was an undisclosed matter. I don't know. I wonder when, but I'm going to be ready. I'm going to have my bags ready. I'm going to be ready for that time to come. And they said, I read, where let's say that man's out there doing work on the house and a neighbor would come by and say, hey, Isaiah, when's the big day? Meaning the wedding day. And you know what he'd say? This is what he'd say. I don't know. Only dad knows. Because even the Jewish groom couldn't pick the day. It had to be his dad that said the day. But you know, there's only one thing I can find in Scripture that Jesus didn't know. You may find more than that, but I can only find one thing that Jesus didn't know. But the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Because he was asked. He said, I don't know. I'm a Jewish groom. Only Daddy knows. Only Daddy knows. And listen to me. As soon as the Father tells the Son, which it could be during my sermon, Come on. go get your bride. Boom, we're out of here. I mean, it's just going to be bodies gone. That's all we're waiting on for the rapture is for dad to say to the son's ready. He's ready. 
I'm sure like any groom, he's ready. He's on mark, get set. And when the Father says go, we're raptured out of here. And those that don't know Christ, who aren't married to Christ, are not going to be raptured. They'll be going through the worst seven years of hell on earth that we've ever experienced called the tribulation. And you think, well, times are bad now. Man, this is children's. This is kindergarten. This is nothing. That If you read Revelation, you'll see, but we're going to be raptured out of here because he's a good groom that followed traditions of the Jewish people to come back at an undeclosed time to get his bride. You see all this stuff about marriage? And it ends up in marriage, in Revelation. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Then he said, and then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. A lot of good things here. We could stay on this forever. What it's saying is, once she was betrothed, which that's the legal binding agreement. It was binding. You had to get unbetrothed by the law. It was so binding. You had to almost get divorced from the betrothal. So we're betrothed. We're safe. We're sealed. But we're going to have a marriage ceremony. We had the betrothal ceremony here. But in heaven... We'll finish this whole ceremony with a marriage ceremony. That's why it talks about this marriage stuff in heaven. To follow what I'm saying here, we're the bride of Christ. That's why church is so important. We as believers are together, and we are the bride of Christ. And one day, the bride and the groom come together, and the bride has made herself ready. First of all, we have the garment of, of Christ, because in him we're made perfect. Not in ourself, but when we receive him as our Lord and Savior, he gives us his perfect righteousness. So we're made ready for that wedding day. And guess what? After the end of that celebration, we'll have a marriage supper of the Lamb. A lot of debate what's going to be on that meal. I think seafood and Mexican food will be served. But I'm not sure. That's just a big guess. I don't want you to have my opinion on that. But we're going to have a feast, a celebration. We come together. We're with our Lord. You show me one bride that's not getting ready for her wedding. I've never seen anybody, hey, you get ready? Ah, not really. I'm kind of dreading it. You're dreading it? Yeah. Are you looking forward to being with your groom? Ah, no, not really. Really? <laughs> Are you sure you're getting married? You really got engaged? What believer? What believer? who made their commitment to Christ, wouldn't say, oh, I get to be with him face to face forever. <laughs> wow. That's what we're to do. Even the place we're going to live. John said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down to heaven from God. This is where we're going to live forever, if you're a Christian, in that holy city. And John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was trying to describe it. Oh, how can I use it in words? It's so beautiful. And John says it's like a bride adorned for her husband. Why? Why did he use those words? Because that's what's in it, is us. <laughs> We're the bride, and doesn't a bride get all dollied? That, that's probably not a word. Dolled up, fixed up, dressed up. I don't know how these say it, but you know what I'm saying. They, they, get, they look their best on that day, should I say, without getting in trouble. Not that they don't look good now, but they look their very, 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 very best on that day. Okay? I mean, all the makeup, all the clothes, all of it's, they want to look their very best on that day. And John says, that's what this city looks like. It looks like a bride because it's full of brides coming down. Wow, that we get to live with him forever. I want to conclude with this verse. A lot of people are, don't know why this is what it is, because you're married and you think this is not going to be good. Jesus was answering the questions about marriage in heaven. He said, for in the resurrection there's neither Mary nor given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. People are finding out, well, if I'm multiple married, then who's my husband in heaven? Jesus said, there's no marriage, and there's no given in marriage in heaven. We're going to be like the angels. It'll be like brothers and sisters living in God's house. You'll still know who they are. 
You, if they're a believer and you're a believer, you're saved, they're saved, you'll know who they are more than you even know who they are now. You're going to know them in a greater way. You will know who they are, but you won't be married to them. And they're not going to be your wife and you're not going to be their husband because that doesn't exist in heaven. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But here's the primary reason. We don't want to be distracted from our marriage to the Lord. Okay, two of us got that. We got to get this clear. We don't want to be distracted about marriage to somebody else in heaven because he's the one who paid with his blood to take us. We want to be focused on him. You gave your life for us. You saved us. Thank you. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. I'd be in hell because of my sin, but you died on the cross for me. And so there's no competition between, oh, which is my husband and which, we're on that husband. We're, on the, we're his bride. And I believe that's the main reason that there won't be that in heaven. What's a good reason to know that church is a main priority of life? Because Christ died for the church. And we are his bride. How important is that? What a priority is that? That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. And we're in this together. Yes, the church is not a building. The church is the people. Ministering to each other, helping each other, praying with each other, encouraging each other, working as a team to win people to Christ, inviting people to come because we are concerned and cared about people. We want to see people grow. We want people saved. We want to see lives change. We want to see marriage change. We're all working in this as a team together because it takes everybody part to carry this out. And we're to say, eh, that's just your bride. Let's go on. Uh-uh. That's important to him. It's us as a group. It's us. Yes, we're saved individually. Yes, individually we're his bride, but he calls it the church because it's a group of believers together. And it's a high priority to him. It should be a high priority to us because the beginning all the way through Revelation has talked about this one issue, about us being the bride. And repetition is the key to learning. And so if it's repeated that much, it really must be something important to him. And it is. Because he gave his life for it. What are we going to do? It should change our life. We should say, you know what? My vision is not just about me. My vision is about what can God use this church as a group of believers to do to reach our world for Christ. I want to see people change for the glory of God. I want to see more brides up there in heaven. And he does as well. That's our mission. Otherwise, you'd get saved and he'd take you on home right there. Right? Saved, raptured, saved, raptured. Because if we're going to be there anyway for eternity, why don't we just go then? No, he has a job for us to do. Saved for a purpose, which goes back to our first point, the work of the service. The service of work, the ministry that he's called us all to. We'll be looking at other reasons at the next message of why Christ the church is important to him as we move forward for Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet, this is a point in our service that we, we use this time to reflect on what God's shown us in his word. And that right there where you are, what has God spoken to you? I think the first thing is, if you've never come to know Christ, I'm not talking about religion I'm not talking about going to some religious activity. I'm talking about have you ever made a commitment to Christ realizing he died on the cross for you, realizing he took your place on the cross to pay for your sin, realizing he rose from the dead victorious over sin, and that he has called you to be his own. Have you received that free gift of salvation and became a Jesus follower? I'm not even going to use the word saved. Have you become a Jesus follower? If not, he stands here not to judge you. We're already judged because of our sin. He stands here to welcome you. The invitation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice, I will come into him. If you've never done that, what greater time, greater place to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and become a Jesus follower 
We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. It's a free gift of salvation. But we make that commitment to follow him all the days of our life. That's how much he loves you. He died on the cross for you. And if you've never received Christ, today can be your day. Others who know Christ, what has Christ shown you? As we've looked at this passage, the body of Christ, why is it important? Because it's his bride. Is it a priority to you? Has, has he been a priority to you? Has the things of God been a priority to you? Or have they been replaced with something else? It's so easy to do. It even happens in our marriages where we, sometimes our love grows cold. It can happen in our relationship with Christ. So if you're a believer, just right where you are to, Respark that fire for your groom, Jesus. Reignite that first love that you had for him when you gave your life to Christ. Others may be saying, you know what, I, I'm part of the body of Christ. I need to recommit to finding my place where I can serve the Lord, to be that body part he's called me to be. Others may be dealing with some other issues that are just weighing on your heart and mind. God stands here as your groom to be able to minister to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we give you this time. God, as your Holy Spirit moves in this place, Father, we pray that, God, your work be done. God, all you ever want for is our best. While we run from you, I have no idea, because you're running after us with the abundance of life. And we run away with things that really don't matter. Father, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that your work would be done today in each and every heart. Father, I know it requires surrender. Surrender to you. But Father, we're asking for you to do your work in each and every heart, Father. God, we know this is your place and your, your work, Father, that you're doing in each and every heart. And we place that before you. And may you be glorified during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music plays, I'll be down here in front. Some others will be down in front. If you'd like us to show you how to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you just want to come and kneel at the altar. Maybe you just want to do business between you and the Lord where you are. Maybe you want to come to join the church. You're a believer. Maybe you just want to have somebody pray for you for something you're going through. Just be sensitive to the Lord's movement as we sing. captives free song of hope a song of praise a song that's written for these days there's a song that's rising up in me we sing hallelujah 
Father, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, for you to suffer that way for us, to take us for that ultimate price. Lord, we, we are so grateful. God, we can't pay you back, that's for sure. But Lord, our life can be a thank you note to you for all you've done. So, Father, may your will be done. Father, we pray for us as a church. Father, we, we want to seek and save that which was lost as well to point them to you. We know we can't do it, but you do the seeking, you do the saving, but we want that same passion to seek and to have those people saved and to point them to you. We're only the matchmaker. We just bring them to you for the marriage because you do the saving. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for each and every person you've led to this fellowship for such a time as this. And may you, we use, be used by, for your honor and glory, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. praise the Lord. You may be seated, just a few uh, things to wrap up on. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna make this first announcement. Um, Many of you know David from the other campus. Uh, Barn with spina bifida, never uh, walked a day in his life for 50 plus years, uh, but served the Lord mightily. Uh, found out what he could do in a wheelchair, not what he couldn't do. You know, he, he, didn't, he wasn't one of those people who well, I'm in a wheelchair, I can barely, can't lose my legs and I can only use one arm, uh, but I can do something. And he found more to do than you'd be amazed at you know he called people to invite him he called people to remind him of events he passed out bulletins he uh, worked in the lobby he just he worked in Awana helping kids he just found a way but he went to be with the Lord uh, and so we'll be having his service at the spring campus at 10 30 many of you have met David and we just want to let you know that that service would be over there so uh, I've asked uh, Jason, our youth minister, to make our announcements, uh, and so I'll be out in the lobby to greet our guest, and so uh, he'll be doing those for us, and so praise the Lord, we got some people to step up to do those things. So Jason, if you'd uh, come and make the announcements for us. Hi. All right, I don't know if I need glasses to look up there or down here. I think I'm going to go up there. All right, so to start off with, this Wednesday we're doing the Chili Cook-Off. It is a uh, volunteer appreciation night. You don't have to be a volunteer to show up. It's uh, just a night that we celebrate together uh, and honor some of our volunteers that help this church uh, stay afloat. So come Wednesday, enjoy some chili. And, um, you know, last year, I, this, I don't know why I still hang on to this. Somebody won with like a, a chicken pot pie. Uh, Chili has to be meat, folks, okay? Just kidding. Um, Mike's not here. He won that one last year with this chicken pot pie. Um, kids' clothing distribution is right after the chili cook-off. So last year, uh, I think there was about 520 families or 520 children that got uh, blessed with some clothes and part of, well, from our donations. Um, so come this year and enjoy part of volunteering and being a part of that uh, is a blessing to a lot of families out there in the community. It's going to be a little bit of a rush, this one, so we do need some volunteers Thursday and Friday. Uh, the church is going to be open from 8 to 4, something like that, Thursday and Friday, because we have chili cook off the night before. Uh, we got a lot of tables to move and a lot of clothes to bring in here, so please um, take some time and enjoy the chili. Work it out, and then come in here Thursday and Friday and help us set up with these closing donations. Um, VBS, Vacation Bible School. What is that one? VBS, Vacation Bible School. We need your ideas and creativity. So there's a planning committee. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, February 7th at 6 p.m. we got another week or two to plan for that. Uh, but start thinking about it. 
So this is a planning committee. So we're your ideas. We're gonna we're gonna use those and and incorporate that and put that into place for the kids <coughs> for the summer. We're starting early, so come on February seventh and help us plan for that. And then the men's event, save the date, March 1st and 2nd. If you need to break out your cell phone and take a picture, go ahead and do that now. We'll have some flyers coming soon, right? Okay. Uh, until then, don't wait. Let's start inviting uh, your, your, your fellow men out there so they can start warning their, their families where they're going to be on March 1st and 2nd. Finally, we have, oh, online. You can... For our guests, thank you for coming. Tim's going to be out there waiting to meet you. Um, there's a welcome card behind or maybe uh, in front of you on the seat, so fill those out so we can, well, Tim wants to give you a gift out there. Uh, he's going to tell you that he mugged you, just heads up. Um, but fill that out so we can get a hold of you, and we're not going to come to your door and bother you. It's just uh, so we get to know you a little bit. Finally, tithes and offerings, there's three ways to give. You can give in person. There's little boxes in the back. You just drop it in there. There's no plate passing. You can uh, pay online. You can give online or by mail. Um, quick story. This is just, so my daughter just turned 16, got a job. And we talked about tithe a little bit. Um, it starts as soon as you get your first paycheck, right? You're giving your tithe and offering. It's not, uh, I think what I was going through, my check was $50. You know, if I do the old Jewish tradition, that's five bucks. How's that going to help the church? Well, that's dog water. That's not what it's about, right? It's you honoring, uh, it's humbling for you to know that God gave you this ability, this time, the money, the knowledge to be able to go to work and do those things. So it is humbling and it's a, it's part of the worship, so. Uh, honor the Lord your Father with your tithes and offerings. Folks, y'all have a... Oh, wait, let's pray and we'll close this out, all right? Uh, I'll, let's do this. Father, we love you and thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you so much for this message. Just the fact that you're preparing for, the, for me to be your bride, that's insane. Um, how you even know my name is beyond me and that you're preparing a place for me and you want me as your bride. I thank you so much for that, Jesus. Thank you for this this sermon and this message and uh, be with us Father as we grow this message isn't meant to hold us over until next Sunday I think I lost count there was 40 something verses that we saw up here today I just ask that you be with us all with uh, conviction that we go home and that we feed ourselves like he mentioned at the beginning we have to feed ourselves to grow uh, and give us that conviction and reminders and availability Father to make those things happen in your name we pray Lord Amen